Academy Sports and Outdoors wants to thank teachers for everything you do. That's why they're giving you 10% off your entire purchase from July 31st to September 5th, just in time for back to school. So swing by your local Academy store or save online at academy.com on all the top brands like Nike, Adidas, and Freely. Don't wait. Start enjoying your special thanks and savings today. Teachers and school staff, please bring your school ID to receive your discount at checkout. Fisherman's Hello and welcome to the Fisherman's Post Saltwater Podcast Series. This episode is titled Southern Flounder on Artificials. I'm going to be talking with Captain Bob Strange of Strange Magic Fishing Charters out of the North Myrtle Beach area. We're going to be talking about the types of artificials, including colors, places to hunt flounder. We're going to be talking about tide, and then we're going to finish up with the popping cork option for artificials for flounder. My name is Gary Hurley of Fisherman's Post. Fisherman's Post has been serving the saltwater fishing community of North Carolina since 2003. We've been bringing you fishing reports, fishing information, fishing tournaments, fishing schools, and here in our latest and greatest effort, the Fisherman's Post Saltwater Podcast series, where we reach out to our captain and guide friends from up and down the North Carolina coast and ask them to share with us their their thoughts, their insights on how to catch more fish more often. And in this endeavor, I am joined every week by my podcast partner, Billy Thorpe of Thorpe Creative. Billy, it feels good, as it always does, to be back in the podcast studio. What's up, Gary? Yeah, man, it's always good to be back in the in the podcast seat, in the chair, talking about fishing, learning about flounder fishing. I'm super excited about this episode, so appreciate everyone who makes this possible, including everyone who listens. And be sure, if you do listen, leave us a review wherever you listen to your podcast, um, or if you watch on YouTube, be sure to leave us a comment there. I always enjoy reading those, even if you make fun of me. I enjoy reading. No, I'm just kidding. I, not really. If you especially, make fun of Gary, I enjoy if especially you make fun of Gary. if you make fun of Billy, we enjoy them. <laughs> <laughs> and I would say, yeah, I actually had that thought. It seemed like early on we were getting more comments and now we're getting less comments. And yeah. that's what, that's I, I would love to see it increase. Either you're crushing it and we're creating some amazing content or we suck. It's going to be one or the other. They're listening or watching the podcast and then going immediately out and trying to apply it and catch a fish. They don't, they're they spending don't less time. time in front of the computer yeah. or on the phone. That makes sense. That makes sense. They don't have time. So anyway, well, I'll, speaking of time, I'll, I'll hurry this along so we can talk about fishing. But I do want to talk about our sponsors really quickly, and uh, we'll talk about our newest sponsor. So first up is SRD20. So you can go to srd20.com, and they uh, provide cleaning products for for the boater, for the outdoors person. And I got a couple here. I got the waterless wash and wax, Gary. So our friend Stuart over here at SRD20 sent these over. And then also the graphene, um, what is this, spray protecting. There you go. Um, so he sent some of these over. So if you guys want to check that out, if you're looking for um, some new products to try on your boat, to, to clean them, to wax them, uh, and also cars and kayaks and all kinds of other stuff as well. So they sent these over. Um, I almost drank one earlier, so I almost made a huge mistake. But it, good thing it has directions on the bag if I do. <laughs> yeah, I like the uh, I like the motto. It shouldn't be hard work. I mean, if you yeah. if you have a boat and you're trying to take care of that boat, sure, it's a labor of love. But there are plenty of times where you want it to be short work but effective work. SRD20.com. Check them out. Yeah, and Gary has some spare time on Saturday, so if you can't figure it out, bring it over to his house. He'll help you. Right. Yeah. You got two, you got, <laughs> Good you luck got, catching me. You got teenage boys. They'll get out there and clean them. <laughs> Good luck getting them. <laughs> Good luck across the board. And also, there's our, some there's some hours in the middle of the night that I'm not working. Maybe I could do help out then. I'll just set my alarm clock. Sp- spray on, or watch on, spray off, or whatever. Uh, all right, I'll get to our next sponsor here, Marine Warehouse, the longest running sponsor of the Fisherman's Post podcast. Get a message from them. We'll be right back. At Marine Warehouse, we have everything from trailer, trailer parts, engines, engine parts, new boats, boat parts, a full store. We have a service department. We are your one-stop shop for marine equipment and hardware. We offer a wide variety of parts and accessories for all your marine needs. The best part about working at Marine Warehouse Center is to help customers really get the most out of their coastal lifestyle and share our love for the water. At Marine Warehouse, we're here to get you out on the water because of our love for the water. We like being out there and we want you out there with us. 
There you go. Gary. Ah, our good friends. Man, I'll tell you, the thought I had watching that is like, hey, don't overlook trailer care. Don't overlook that trailer. When we live here in a hurricane central area, you know, you want that trailer to work when you need it to work. And they are as good as trailers as anything else they do, man. You know, I, I mean, I recently had my trailer serviced, you know, in part because of the potential hurricane. And now that we're in that time of the calendar. Yeah. Yeah, man, that's a good point. And they do a lot of trailers. I see those stickers on trailers all over the place. Even my a neighbor lot. my neighbor has one. Well, he bought a motor there too. He he came there because of us, by the way. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't know Sweet. that would be true, but I'm gonna keep saying that. <laughs> keep saying it, man. Keep saying it, yeah. Give me credit for that sale. Um so well, as you know, Gary, Emmett has been traveling quite a bit and we've been trying to keep up with him and people sending pictures and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, so we've been doing a little bit on the show called where in the world is Emmett, where I give you a couple of hints and you can guess Emmett's location. Where in the world is Emmett? I think I only need one hint this time. One hint. Okay. So he is in the same town where Charlie Daniels was born. <laughs> We're out of my zone already. Tennessee, Kentucky. I don't know, man. I don't know my brown liquor. All right. It, I'll, I'll give you another guess. He is in the town where michael nashville we're talking born. music we're not talking liquor he's in nashville no he was not born in nashville michael uh, jordan was born in the city wilmington you, yeah wilmington you got it gary you got it emmett is in the studio right here with me <laughs> he's he's hanging out hold on i got him a microphone you want to say something to the people <laughs> emmett? emmett you want to say anything <laughs> emmett Nothing. He's not a Billy. Words, did right? you forget about this spit until right before airtime? <laughs> no, absolutely not. I actually worked really hard on this bit. I mean, so hard, Gary. Billy, that, hold on. So hard that if somebody's watching this video, I nerded out so much so I took a picture of my original background. I'm in front of a green screen, Gary, just to make this bit happen. Okay. Just to, just I, to make it happen. I would like to retract my. <laughs> accusation please do Emmett does not appreciate it. Emmett you sure you don't want to say anything he, he doesn't he's just here hanging out supporting me as the producer of the show <laughs> what a great bit man that was so funny I, I knew you was going to enjoy it how do we not get more sponsors <laughs> no, I, we're going to lose one over that <laughs> hold on are you sure Emmett come on up here buddy <laughs> oh my god <laughs> If you didn't watch that on the video, you need to go to YouTube right now and watch it because that's the greatest bit we've done on this show, Gary. I'm probably going to get a comedic deal out of this. Anyway, All right. anyway I divulge. What, what's the next topic? Fish oh. photo, please, for God's sake. <laughs> All right, here we go. Here's Rate Rene with a, however you pronounce it, sorry if I butchered that, with a 21-inch flounder that was caught on a gulp bait while fishing in the topsail area. Uh, so 21 inches, Gary? What's your guess? I think I'm disconnected. I don't think you are. I think I can. Oh, good. Hear you. You're good. I got that call. I thought the call took. I'm going to give that one without question. I'm going to give that the 21 inch nod. I'm going to say no reason to be skeptical. Congratulations to him. All right. Congratulations to you for the 21 inch nod. All right. Our 21 inch fish. It was a good sized fish. And I guess uh, here soon he'll be able to keep that thing. So good for him. All right, Gary. Well, I'm going to pass the mic to you, man. You can talk about fishing and less about yeah, my bad bits. I'm going to be talking. I'm going to be talking flounder here. But before I go, a reminder: Billy's best takeaway. I'm coming back for Billy's best takeaway at the culmination with my show of my talk with Bob Strange. And I'll also quickly mention weekly inshore fishing reports brought to you by FishermansPost.com. FishermansPost.com member content, weekly inshore fishing reports. But right now, I would like to welcome to the show Captain Bob Strange of Strange Magic Fishing Charters out of the North Myrtle Beach area here to talk to me about flounder. Welcome, Bob. It's a pleasure to have you back. I didn't hear him. Yeah, I think, hold on a second. Let me. Billy, I didn't. Three, two, one. 
So it's my pleasure to welcome back to the show, Captain Bob Strange, Strange Magic Fishing Charters from the North Myrtle Beach area. A pleasure to be talking with you again, Bob. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Gary. I'm uh, glad to be here. Well, right on. We're going to talk about flounder. We're going to talk about southern flounder on artificials. But as you know, we don't get right to it. You got two questions. First question, you tell me you're ready. I give you question number one. Yep, shoot. So why should we sit here and listen or watch and listen? You talk about southern flounder or any flounder for that matter. That's a great question. Maybe I should leave. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, I've been, I've been fishing my whole life, and uh, uh, flounder is probably one of my favorite fish to catch just because the fact they're so good to eat, except, of course, in North Carolina, you can't keep them right now, but uh, in South Carolina, you can. But uh, hopefully I can give you a little bit of insight of how to fish these fish for these guys uh, using some artificial baits, and, uh, and you'll be a little bit more successful, and, and uh, hopefully your flounder will crawl up on your list as well. All right, that's an acceptable answer. You qualify for question number two, and as tradition goes, it's a non-fishing related question. Are you ready for question number two, sir? Yes, sir. How about it? All right, well, I'm playing off a of strange magic. I got a couple of strange magic, emphasis on magic questions for you. Question number one is easier than question number two. Question number one, what U.S. landmark did David Copperfield make disappear? Oh, my gosh. Um, really big U.S. landmark. Washington Monument. Go to further north to New York City. Empire State Building. Statue of Liberty. I knew that's what you're going to say next. Statue of Liberty. <laughs> I was around in... tip of my t so, it, so I said the next one's harder, yeah. unless you're a Magic fan, which oh, I'm man. not. I mean, I found this on the internet. How long gonna... did... I thought you were going to ask me. Did... Electric Light oh, Orchestra. Shoot. Yeah. <laughs> How long did David Blaine freeze himself in ice in Times Square? Do you remember that one from, what was it, 2000? Uh, not familiar with David, but uh, I would say, uh, how about an hour? How about 64 hours? I mean, it was a big magic trick. 64 Ooh. hours frozen in ice in Times Square. But enough about strange magic. Let's get to <laughs> flounder. Yeah. People love flounder. You know, again, yes, North Carolina rules have tempered our enthusiasm for them, but it's still there. It's still beneath the surface. So in your show notes, we're going to start with artificials instead of talking about where to find them. And I, I like that. I like that break. So when you're talking about artificial options for Southern Flounder, right? what comes to mind? Usually, usually what I use, Gary, is uh, I'll usually uh, just pin artificials onto jig heads and uh and you use primarily three weights 16th eighth ounce and quarter ounce uh depending on how fast the tide's running you, you have to be on the bottom for the for the flounder obviously because they, they that's where they live uh and as everyone knows they they have a a white side and a and kind of a camouflage side and the, you know obviously the white side is on the bottom and they have two eyes on the on the top and so they're ambush uh, fishers and so they they just wait for bait to come right up across their their head and and then they get, come up and slam it and then go right back down all right so i'm going to get you i'm going to push you to be way more specific and we'll start with jig heads and then we'll go to the soft plastics so i am well aware and many people talk about the the weight of the jig head depends on you know the current or the depth so what is the goal the goal is for it to sink. I mean, it's flounder on the bottom. Do we want to make sure right. it stays on the bottom? Do we want to give it the least possible weight to stay on the bottom? Like, what is your goal what, when you're trying to figure out the weight? I, I think it's always good to try to mix it up a little bit. Uh, you you want to always try to keep your rod tip kind of an, an, angled downward when you're twitching that thing back. And you can go anywhere from just doing a slow retrieve to doing some twitches in there as well. You kind of have to, you do have to kind of zero in on what the fish are looking for that on that particular day. Some days they're looking for a twitch and a pause. Some days they're just looking for a slow retrieve back on the bottom. Uh, it, it really depends. Uh, the weight of the jig head has a lot to do with it. Obviously, the lighter the jig head, the slower the, the, the fall is going to be after you twitch. Uh, and it just, it, it really depends on the current. If you've got a lot of current, obviously a lighter jig head is going to, is, is going to be moving a lot faster through that current. 
if you want to concentrate on on certain spots that you have a, when you have a fast current, and I, I would step your weight up just a little bit on, on something like that, uh, and also different times of the year as well. You know, with, with the size of the bait right now in August, the size of the bait's getting pretty big, uh, so you can actually up up your sizes of your of your jig heads as well as your plastics. All right, and for we're going to talk about again. We'll talk about the self plastic here in a quick follow up. But like, do you have any opinion about whether it's just like a natural metal color or redhead or whitehead? Do the eyes? Does that is that anywhere in your consideration when you're buying a jig head? Well, it, it, I think the the jig heads themselves. I'm I'm kind of I, I probably use red ones more than anything else. Do, do I think it really matters that much? You, you know, red. I think maybe introduces a, a, a little bit of a, a color aspect as far as it may look like it's perhaps bleeding or an injury or it, 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 with the soft plastics i think the fish are zeroing in on that the fact that it's going to be an easy meal perhaps a injured bait fish fish and I, I think that red color adds to it because the fact that it could it, it, it may fool them into thinking that's blood of some kind uh, uh that, that's just my thought uh, it seems like when people use white and, and chartreuse jig heads, the, the success rate is not that much different. But okay. red, red, I'm kind of, I'm kind of, I'm probably a little more partial to. And then, so now let's go to soft plastics. Because to say you just put a soft plastic on a jig head, I mean, there's so many soft plastic oh, options. Good. Absolutely. So give me, a, give me a couple. I mean, of course, I want to know your go-to, but I want to know other options that you want to make sure you have on the boat you know, just to, right. in case numero uno isn't working that day. Right. Well, I think anything with a little bit of scent in it, yeah, yeah, it gives you, it gives you a little bit more of an advantage. You, you always want to try to, when you, when you fish, you always want to try to put yourself into the most advantageous position. So the, the more that you can do that, the more success you're going to have. Uh, so, so I kind of, uh, I'm a little bit more partial to the gulp baits that, that, that have that, uh, that, that, certain amount of uh, uh, scent that's uh, impregnated into it. And, and, uh, and it seems like the, uh, uh, the gulp baits that work best for flounder are, are that swing mullet. And I've, I've got some, some, some examples here. Okay. And, uh, and the, and these guys, and, and that, 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 it seems like the chartreuse and the white, uh, usually uh, we have the most success with, and, and it's kind of funny. You can go in one spot one day, and they'll be slamming the chartreuse, and then the next day they won't touch the chartreuse, and they'll slam the white. So it's a, it, it's you just have to do do a little exper experimentation there. And I did, but, uh, I was guilty of not looking that close. Were those three inch swimming mullets? I mean, I know yeah, you they're, already they're, said like the yes, size they, might depend on the time of year and the size right, of the natural right, bait. Yeah. The biggest ones you can get right now because the baits are really big. So, so th those were four inch, and so you 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 do want to get some some, uh, some bigger baits for right now. Uh, the, the only disadvantage with the, with that swing mullet kind is that uh, the the tails are a little bit thin. So if you get if you get some trash fish coming in there like some croakers or, or lizard fish or something like that, they're gonna you know occasionally bite those tails off. But uh, that's just just fishing. And then if I said. Bob Strange, you're going to go flounder fishing tomorrow, and you're not allowed to have a swimming mullet soft plastic on the boat. I'm just taking that power away from you. Then what are you going to put on a, on a jig head? You know, I think I think again, if you go with anything that has some stink on it, any kind of any one of those gulp, the, the swimming shrimp, or they also work pretty well too. It seems like every year you you have a bait that they ha have a tendency to kind of hit more, and, and a certain color they have they have a tendency to to hit a little bit more. So uh, I, I would say stick with the gulp baits, but but if you do have to go with like a Z-Man or something like that, just have some some stink you can put on with some Procure or uh, it, you, you know uh, any of the other varieties of uh, of stink that comes comes along. Okay, and then uh, a follow up on the color. So that white or chartreuse, um, again, anyone I get it. Anything can work on any given day, but if we're trying to pattern. Have you noticed like on darker water days, you do something or cloudier days, you do something? I mean, have you seen any trends yeah. or any patterns in that capacity? That, that's a great question. You, you know, as we're all told, like, like, you know, on darker days, cloudier days, you're supposed to use 
darker baits uh, or darker sw swim baits. Uh, and on brighter days, I suppose you use brighter. Uh, do I find that that's a pattern that always holds? No. Uh, I mean, some, t some days you can, it can be a cloudy day and you can use a bright white and it works wonderfully. Uh, and some days you can have a, the brightest day in the world and use a darker bait and it, it works real well too. Uh, so other darker baits you can, you can use. I mean, there's, there's other, all sorts of, this is a, a real big, this is a little bit bigger bait uh, that, you, that you can use. Uh, it's one of those jerk baits and, and this one's uh, like a, a five, I think it's a five inch, but uh, uh, something like this uh, are, are always good to try. Other dark ones you can, you can use. And of course, uh, you, you know, the, you can go with Z-Man's got these power prawns and yeah, there's just so many different kinds and you can even use like the, the Z-Man ha has these paddle tails that, that will work too. But it, but it does, but the nice thing about it, those two is that when you, when you do fish for flounder, it also puts you in the run because trout love these things and also redfish love these things. So, and most of the fish that you're, you're fishing for are all going to be in the same area. Okay, which is, um, which is a, a nice, nice byproduct. So I, I'm going to keep talking about, I guess, terminal tackle before we go to where you start to target them. And my right. question would be, fluoro versus mono. What test? And what I'm also curious about is what knot you use to the jig head. Do you like like a cinch knot, or do you like more of a loop knot that gives the jig head, I guess, potentially more action? Right. Yeah, I, I think. Uh, you know, I think the thinking I think it goes to uh, I, I use a loop knot uh, usually to to the jig head itself. Uh, to me, it seems like it gets a little bit better action with, with that on there. Uh, you know, I guess I guess uh, all the fish we've interviewed, they uh, they uh, they have their own opinions as well. But uh, it seems that the loop knot works well, well, and it's a good it's a good solid knot, and it, and it works uh, works very well for us. And uh, and you just uh, and it like. like we got our, you know, our jig heads right here. This is an eighth ounce, but uh, an eighth ounce is probably a good is good bait to start with. Uh, you can bump it up to a quarter. Here's a quarter, and then of course you got you got the sixteenth for for uh, for later as well. But these all have long shanks, so so you can actually put a pretty big bait on these things, which which is kind of a nice thing. Uh, what's your what's your opinion about fluoro versus mono, and when what pound tax? Right. Yeah, so so I, my my main line I have a braid and I use 15 pound test with, with Power Pro. Uh, color on that I don't think really makes that big of a difference. I have, I have like the the moss green color and uh, I use fluoro leader uh, 20 pound uh, and and, uh, and usually put a yeah three or four foot uh, a piece of that on to connect onto the jig. Okay. So let's go to the places that you like to target then. I mean, I, you know, I think that's a good basis in terminal tackle talk. And so down right. your way, North Myrtle Beach, Little River, you're heading out for a day of flounder fishing. You know, you know, you can organize this conversation however you wish, you know, low tide, mid tide, right. high tide. But, you know, what go, how, how do you strategize like the best chance to hook a flatfish or many flatfish? Well, I, th I think the things you always want to look for in any fishing spot for really any fish is that, is that you want to always look for the presence of bait. You want to look for some good structure. Like if you can find some, some nice uh, transitioning banks from grass to shell. Uh, if you have some oyster mounds, if you have good structure like that, or, or if you have uh, a creek or two that kind of meet in one place, if you have a, a big bend around a creek, if you've got a, a nice deep hole, and, and, and so structure like that is, is, is wonderful. But presence of bait is very important because you want to make sure that there's bait there or else the fish aren't going to be there because uh, they're, they're looking to eat. Uh, and then accessories to that would be the presence of birds. If you have some, some blue herons or you got some egrets hanging around, I mean, that's going to be a good sign because they're, they're not there for their health. They're there to eat as well. Uh, and then also, too, if you can see it when you come in, and you want to try to be as stealthy as you can when you come into your to your places. But uh, if you can see the presence of some boils that you know, or some some fish that that seem to be feeding uh, in the area, that you can that you can uh, notice things like that. Uh, that's a great thing. Yeah, you know, uh, again, presence of bait, seeing shrimp jumping out of the water, great great sign. That means there's a lot of life there, and that's uh, that's uh, definitely a, an area that you want to focus in on. 
So I guess maybe walk me through like how the thinking changes with the tide, like, you know, low tides you typically, and again, everything's a theory, but you know, where do you typically start on low tide and then walk me through the, you know, as the water comes in? Well, the nice thing about flounder is that they're not really married to the tide that much because they'll, they'll hit on a slack tide, whereas, uh, you know, trout and redfish probably not so much. Uh, but, but flounder are kind of unique in that they, that I think they're always, I think they're pigs and they're always looking to, to eat as much as possible. Uh, so on a falling tide, I think it's, you're going to find a little bit more success, uh, uh, in areas where you have, if you've got like a marsh that has several drains, that, that's, those are great places to throw, to throw right, right in, in, in front of that area. Uh, if you can find a creek that is emptying out into a little bit bigger area of water, that's going to be a great place to look. Uh, those fish uh, are realize that the bait, you know, the, obviously the bait goes up into the grass and the marsh, uh, but it doesn't get stuck up there. So when the tide falls, it, all the bait wants to come out. And so that as that bait comes out, those fish are going to station themselves in the areas so that they can just, fish are inherently lazy, so they're going to station themselves right in areas that they know that bait's going to come right over top of them, especially flounder. A flounder's going to be laying on the bottom and just waiting on that bait to come right over top of their head. So if you can find areas that, that are, are more conducive to that, that's going to be, you're going to increase your chances so much more. Uh, and uh, also, so if you have a, a rising tide, you can do it kind of the opposite way. If you, if you have water that's kind of entering into a, a, a little bit skinnier area, you can, you can go up into that creek and then cast back uh, into it as well. Uh, lower tides, uh, I, I think uh, it, you'll have more success if you look for areas where, where the water has drained out and it's going to concentrate the fish a little bit more. There's less places to hide. Uh, that's going to be uh, things that you want to uh, focus on. Higher tides, uh, the, the fish are probably going to be stationed a little bit closer to, like if, if you're up and going up and down a creek, they're probably going to be stationed more toward the shoreline because of the fact that's where all the bait's going up and down, just because the bait doesn't want to get eaten. So they're going to go to areas that, that they think they're not going to be eaten, so that's where the, that's where the flounder are going to be. So if you've, if you've figured out a spot that you want to try out, that you want to target for a little bit, you know, whether it's, you know, a couple of drains, like small drains in a creek on a fallen tide or, you know, creek mouths on a rising tide. What's your methodology? Is it anchor up and really work that area or is it drift with the wind and or tide or is it to control your movement with a trolling motor? I'm kind of, I'm mostly curious about whether you like to really anchor up, whether it's a trolling motor or an anchor in right. cover ground or if you're, you like to be on the move. Well, it, it, it probably depends, especially if, if you take, when I take clients out, uh, you kind of have to, to judge uh, what, what you have. Uh, so some, sometimes you have people who are, who are very good fishermen uh, and, and it gives you a lot, lot more options. So uh, on something like that, I, th I think it's a great, a great way to cover a whole lot of ground is, is just to put your trolling motor out and try to be as stealth as you can, stealthy as you can and, and just kind of patrol up and down those, uh, the, the creek, so if you get some smaller creeks, and then just have them cast uh, to those creek, uh, the creek banks. That's a great way of, uh, of covering a lot of area. Now, on times when you have maybe several anglers in, in, on your boat, uh, you know, and, and it's not going to really, it's not going to be real conducive to having people cast, where there's just going to be too many lines out there. Uh, you're going to probably want to want to go to more spot fishing, uh, uh, but a good thing to do is after you come into an area, let it kind of calm down a little bit after you've run into that area because the fish are going to be a little skittish at that point, and give it a few minutes. Uh, you, you know, you don't want to hang too long at a spot, but but if you if you have been uh, at a, at a at a place that you have been coming to at di different points in the tide that you know will probably cut on, that's that's you want to kind of hang in an area like that. Uh, and, and then uh, if you can, I always like to keep a logbook of, of everything. I, I'm, I've got one back to fr probably 15 years back. Uh, and every, so every time I go, by, I try, try to be real good about writing down. And there definitely is patterns. And, uh, and I would highly recommend everybody to do things like that because in different times of the year, you know, I may get, get to this one place in this one creek and, and for 
July and August with with a water temperature of around between 80 and 85. I know it, 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 right when I'm at dead low tide, this, this place is going to be really good. But it's not going to be good for maybe those two months. And so it's kind of funny like that. So the more time you are on, on the water, the, the, the better that you're going to get at, at doing those things. But I would highly recommend that you, that you write things down so then that way you, kinda, you can't always have a, a good idea where things are, are going to be from, from year to year, especially at different times. And uh, water temperature is very important as well. So if we are spot fishing, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to set up a scenario. You'll see what the question I'm doing. If, if I'm targeting, you know, like a narrow creek and we're sort of up on one grass bank and we're going to just hit the whole creek sort of in front of us, what tends to be the better direction? Is it casting up current and having the current bring my bait back to the boat or is it counting right. down current and sort of fighting the, you know, or pulling the artificial against the current back to the boat yeah it, it seems it seems like the the more success that i have is with when because fish typically will face into the current and the reason being is because the bait's coming that way too and so they're they're going to fish into the current looking for that bait to come to them uh so if you can make a presentation like that so, you, so essentially if you have your have your boat facing into the current and if you cast upstream and let that bait come back, that's going to be a, a kind of a more, little bit more natural presentation. Flounder, I don't think, are at quite as choosy about that as are perhaps trout and redfish. They're, they're a little bit more tuned into that. Um, so I think you have a little more, you, you get a little bit more, uh, uh, I guess I'm not sure if a, a good word would be to say slack, but, but you have a, a little bit more, uh, flexibility uh with with your casting so a lot of times if you if you have if i have four clients in my in my boat you know they're not going to be all four of them going to be able to do that at the same time so which is actually kind of fine because of the fact that the uh the fish don't seem to, to to mind that much especially the flounder so the then my next question would be if i'm on your boat and you've put a artificial in my hand and it either it's cast downstream upstream grass bank, we're moving, whatever it is. And I just say, Hey, captain, I don't, I don't like to think for myself. What's the favorite action you would like me to employ on this artificial? How do you, how do you coach, you know, these clients that come on your boat that really don't know anything and sort of looking to you to help them in every step of the way with success? Yeah. And, and I'm sure every guy can probably, can, can probably vouch for this, but you know, sometimes we get people who are, fantastic fishermen and and they're and they're and you hardly have to tell them anything and uh a lot of times we get people uh, especially that come from the north that are bass fishermen and they they can uh, you know just change over to to the type of fishing we do very quickly and then on the other end of the spectrum you have people who have who have never fished before in their life and you're teaching them how to cast you teach them the whole the whole deal but a lot of times people will pick it up pretty quickly and uh so the, the type of action that, that I like to have uh, my clients do is, is again, put the, you want to have that rod tip kind of down. Uh, and, and the reason being is because when it's down, you, you know that your jig or, or what, whatever you're throwing is going to be on the bottom uh, a lot more. And that's, of course, where those flounder fish are. And so what I like to do is just have, just have them just do a couple little jigs. And, and uh, there's so many different ways you can do it. And from day to day, it changes a little bit. So I always tell them to change it up. You know, maybe on one on one retrieve, you you, you do a single single jerks and pause, single jerk and pause, or on the next uh, on the, on the next time, you just do a straight retrieve, and just try to try to keep bumping it on the ground. Uh, and then sometimes you you can do multiple twitches or do almost like a walk the dog kind of a thing. So uh, all those uh, kind of ways seem to be successful for, for flounder. I think you just have to coax, coax that, uh, that, that fish to want to bite on whatever you, you've got on, the, on, your, uh, on your jig head. Okay, so now my question goes more to like the season. So yes, North Carolina, we got one month this year. So I'm guessing where you target them in the where you would target them in the beginning of September can't be that radically different than where you target flounder, target flounder at the 
towards the end of September. But you, I am talking to a South Carolina captain, so I'm guessing that flounder is something that you still pursue year-round as South Carolina allows you. So this is going to air in September, and you know, mostly North Carolina right. viewers, listeners. But for those that remember the days when we could fish longer or are intrigued about the South Carolina possibility, your conversation about where you target flounder, how might that change in, say, October or November? Well, I, I think probably, uh, you know, the, the, the bigger flounder, uh, the, the more mature flounder, you know, really when you start getting that mullet run, you start getting those first couple cold fronts in, in October, November, uh, those fish have a tendency to, to kind of go out in the ocean, the bigger ones do. The smaller ones will stay inshore. And and, uh, and, the, and the bigger ones can sometimes hang out all the way to the end of December, just depending on what the weather is. Uh, right now, with, with the, the size of the bait being what it is, uh, you know, and if, and if we're talking about September, uh, that, that bait's going to be pretty big. And so you probably want to up your, your sizes of your bait. Uh, however, even even big fish eat small baits. And, and uh, sometimes you'll... You'll catch a flounder and it'll it'll spit up some bait and, and you'll see that it's been eating just very tiny shrimp and uh, so so it, it it varies it varies a lot but i would say probably the, the the as as the summer goes on especially in september september october that's when your bait's going to be the biggest and you have the biggest minnows around you got the biggest shrimp around and uh so those, those fish are going to be that that'll look more natural to them and our I mean, I'm going to ask this question more, I guess, just to sort of help the strange magic cause, you know, by taking the time to do this podcast. I mean, is there any issue with me driving from Wilmington down to North Myrtle Beach and going flounder fishing outside the North Carolina window? I mean, I'm fishing with the South Carolina captain in South Carolina, but I'm driving back into North Carolina, heading back to my hometown in Wilmington. Right. Sure. You know, uh, right. Being right here on the border makes it a little interesting for all of us that, 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 uh, do this all around here and uh so when you, you kind of have to pay attention to to the rules of both states uh because we go back and forth so much however if you have a person that can't let's just say you had a person that came from wilmington and they wanted to fish in south carolina because the season wasn't on in north carolina could we stay in south carolina that whole day absolutely and uh but however if you cross into north carolina and if you have a flounder in your possession and and flounder are not in season in North Carolina like they are right now, then they're the the the, the DNR person is going to be is going to nail you for that. So so you have to be kind of legal in both states. But however, if you if you do a flounder trip right now and you wanted to keep keep flounder, you'd have to stay in South Carolina the whole time. If that makes sense. That does make sense. All right. I think uh, I think I'm ready for the like the last question. I don't even know if you really meant it to be as like a finale, but you had the popping cork option or something similar to that. So right, right. we haven't we haven't talked about a popping cork slip cork or anything like that. So and I, I think that is typically more associated with trout or red drum. You want to sell it right. to me on flounder, and I, I'm in. Tell me about right. the the popping cork option or slip. Yeah, cork well, option. I mean, I'm obviously sorry. this is this, this is just an example of a real simple popping cork, and. Uh, and obviously, you know, if, if you're fishing jetties, you, you're going to fish this with a with a with a slip on here and, and all that sort of thing. However, we're we're going to we're going to, for argument's sake, we'll just say that we're in the in the intercoastal uh, or or we're in a, in a in a back creek, especially probably on a higher tide, uh, because those fish are probably going to be pushed up a little bit more on, onto the shoreline. And so, it's nice to have a presentation where you, if you can, again, if you could if you could theoretically see how a flounder was laying on the bottom and try to try to slide that bait right over top of his head to get him interested um, and so what's nice to be able to do is to have that pop and cork and then run that right up onto the onto the shoreline and if you can uh there, there's a, a free line technique which i'm sure you probably know where you just keep your bail open and you can allow that allow that bait just to drift all the way down the shoreline uh, and you can cover a lot of ground like that being anchored being anchored up just using the tide and and what you'll do is with that free line technique is that you'll just kind of pop that every once in a while and what that does is that keeps you in good contact with your bait so that if a fish does hit it you can lift your rod tip up and set that hook and then flip your bail over at the same time and still have pressure on the fish so that you don't lose that fish because as as we all know those flounder when they uh 
when they come in, they start to shake that head, and that's when you when you typically will lose your your fish is when they're when they're shaking. But uh, the, the longer you can keep that pressure on, the better you're going to be, and you'll be a lot more successful like that. With that uh, popping cork option, you know, you know, again, not in the deeper Little River jetty waters, but back in the creeks like we've been talking, is right. the goal to have the soft plastic make some contact with the bottom and bounce along, or is the goal to have it set as close to the bottom without reaching the bottom when we're flounder fishing? Right, yeah. I, I don't think it's that, that strategic because of the fact that typically that water right, right next to the bank, and you want to be probably within three feet of that bank if you can. Uh, that, so that water is probably going to be in that three foot range, uh, four foot range, and uh, I, I think, what, of course, when you pop it, uh, obviously, you know, the the, the pop sound g gives it a, a, a gives it a little bit of, a, of it makes the fish a little bit interested in it. But also too, that also pops your bait, your artificial bait up in there, and then of course it flutters flutters back down, and that again will get them uh, excited as well. And, and of course, again, if you have the gulp, then you have a scent, scent in there. So you're just you're trying to introduce uh, as uh, as many different things to get that fish interested in eating that bait. Um, and so hopefully you're going to run that right over top of where a, a flounder is going to be going to be sitting. And, and again, being an ambush fi fish, it's going to come up and whack that thing. And and uh, and, and uh, that's why it's nice when you have when you, when you do that free line technique, you keep your thumb on your on your on your spool. And uh, so then that way, you, if, if you do have a hit, you can set that and then flip your bail and keep that pressure on all at the same time. But that, right. that freedom techniques, are, it's a really cool, cool little thing to use. All right. We're going to finish with setting the hook. Now, with live bait, there's debate, which we won't touch on. Let them eat. Don't let them eat. Set the hook. Right. Or wait, wait, wait. And how long you wait. Thoughts on setting the hook with artificials. So, so artificials, uh, like you were saying, if you compare that to live bait, you know, you know, so live bait, now we'll qualify, we'll, we'll separate that live bait into, into like maybe shrimp and a, and a minnow. So, it, so a shrimp, a, a flounder, will, will eat that right away and you do want to set the hook right away. But with a minnow, uh, you do have to, that's, a, that's, the, that's the where, where you, when, you, when, you feel, when you feel that little thump, you're going to let that, let that fish kind of eat that and spin that bait around so it can swallow it, and so that's the that's when you really want to when you want really want to wait. With an artificial, you do the you do you do, you do the hook set, hook set. So if you feel if you feel that bite, you're gonna, you're going to feel it, and and it, it'll it'll be a very strong bite. And if you if you get that, you you definitely want to set that hook and 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 keep that pressure on because that flounder will start shaking its head. A lot of times you'll it's kind of funny, it's, and it's, it's true when you catch it with, uh, with the live bait, too. Uh, the first couple cranks, when you crank that, it'll feel like you almost have a snag, or it'll feel like, it'll feel like you get a big clump of shells. And then all of a sudden, you'll feel, you'll feel that vibration, and you'll know that you're, that you're on. Uh, so you always want to keep that pressure on that fish, because the fact if you, even if you let up for a second, uh, you're, the, the chances of that fish popping off are real high. Because that thing is going to be shaking its head. It's almost like a trout. Trout does the same sort of thing. All right. I, uh, any last thoughts? Captain Bob Strange, this is where we wrap up your podcast. But I'll give you the floor one last time for to wrap it up for us. Or you can tell me I've, I've shared what I know. Well, uh, there, there are so many different ways to fish. And uh, what's nice to be able to do, and I like when I take my clients out, I like to have them try all sorts of different ways of fishing because in that way they can kind of get a flavor of what's what the what our area is like and uh, I, I usually try to have them do all the techniques yeah, yeah we'll, we'll try to do a popping cork we're going to try to do a popping cork with uh, with live shrimp we're going to try to do uh, uh, with with artificials and we're going to try to do live we're going to try to do live minnows on the bottom and dragging them and uh, and we're going to try to uh, try we're going to try for redfish we're going to try for trout yeah and, and we can also fish some some uh, some things like fresh shrimp, you know, for black drum and that sort of thing. But that's a whole different subject. But, but uh, it's, it's, it's nice to be able to try everything because in that way you can kind of zero in on, the, on things that you like to do best. And then maybe the next time you come out, you, you just want to do one or two different techniques. All right. Captain Bob Strange, Strange Magic Fishing Charters out of the North Myrtle Beach area. Man, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts, your insights on how to hook a southern flounder on artificials. I've enjoyed it. Gary, thank you so much. Pleasure. 
Well, Billy. Gary, Gary, man. What an episode. I always say that. I need to come up with something else. <laughs> but it was a good episode. Learned yeah. a lot. Um, yeah, learned a lot. A couple of takeaways. You know, one of the things, the takeaway I was thinking about is the journaling. Um, I, you know, you don't hear many people talk about it, like journaling for 15 years. Uh, I saw a smile come across I was, I was, just his face. This is like, you know what? I'm proud of that moment. I thought, dang, that's a pretty good idea. I mean, one, just for you personally, selfishly tracking stuff year by year, but then also as a legacy to leave it to family members and other people. I just thought that was pretty cool that I was like, man, good for you, Bob, that you wrote 15 years of notes and journaling down of fishing. Like, uh, anyway, I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. And then, and then the whole free lining, that whole section, like I learned a lot of, about that. So that was, uh, I mean, I've done it a little bit before, but the thumb on the spool with, for flounder, and I, I, a popping cork and flounder did not even come in the same brain wave as me. Like when he showed it pre-showed, just to make sure he had it lined up, I was like, "How are you going to use that on a flounder?" So anyway, I learned today. Yeah, man. So, yeah, yeah, I, I actually had the thought. Uh, like, here's me being. I mean, I don't know. You you can judge me later, but I was like, when he talked about journaling, I was like, man, I wonder if that has to be a dying breed. Like even the guys now that track everything, are they really writing stuff down? Now some are, I mean, I think it is like in some instances, the most effective way to literally write it down. But as you know, we're in a world that is more and more everything on the phone and less and less, you know, pen and paper. But yeah, yeah man, I mean, journaling, I see the value Again, I have some elements in my day-to-day -day life that have to be written that can't be on the phone. So, yeah, man, good for him. Good for all the captains that do that. Yeah, text it to yourself, I guess, for all you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, some. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, but it was good, man. I, I thought that was pretty cool, just to, just you know, 15 years of legacy. So, uh, great episode, man. Learned a lot. Can't wait to get out there and, and use some of the information, as I'm sure – Everyone listening and watching, and just a reminder, if you are still confused about how you go catch a fish, then check out our fishing reports happening every single week. Um, super great guys. 11 different guides from up and down the coast coming to talk to you about what's going on, uh, what's happening, what they forecast, what do they see, what are they doing, some of the stuff. I mean, a lot of good information. So just want a quick reminder of that. And support our sponsors, SRD20. Dot com and then uh, Marine Warehouse Center as well. Go buy your new boat and then buy some cleaning products <coughs> and get that thing cleaned up. So there you go, Gary. We'll see, see you in the next one, man. Okay.